Uh, everybody, welcome uh, today to our, is it our penultimate uh, yes, colloquium uh, talk? Uh, so um, we are going to be addressed today by a really exciting uh, speaker, Carol Vescu, um, who uh, has published and done research broadly in human language technologies, but I, I would say is especially well known for her speech work. Uh, she uh, is currently a professor at uh, the Toyota Technical Institute in Chicago. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, the Toyota Technical Institute is only tangentially related to cars, and that it was uh, endowed with money made by selling cars, but it's actually about uh, uh, technology and about things like the speech research that you'll hear about today. So um, I'd like to, uh, without further ado, turn the time to Karen, who will talk to you about what, what uh, self-supervised speech representation models know. So here, let's join in. Okay, thanks very much for having me and uh, for the nice introduction. Um, indeed, we don't uh, do anything related to cars. We, uh, we're just a computer science graduate institute. And the work that I'll be talking about today is work with um, these four grad students um, and is mostly covered by the two papers that are mentioned at the bottom of the slide, but I also threw in some fresh results hot off the presses that are a little more speculative, but I thought it would be fun to include them in case uh, they might be interesting and might raise some points for discussion. Okay, um, so this talk is about uh, trying to figure out what self-supervised representation models know, layer by layer. Um, and so I'll just give a little bit of introduction to how we got here and why, why we're studying this question. Um, so I think it's fair to say that um, the state of the art um, approaches in spoken language research um, can be divided into two general approaches. Um, one is to take all of the labeled speech that you can find with labels for your task um, and train a model on all of those labels. Uh, for example, this is the whisper speech recognition model, which was trained on 700,000 hours in about 100 languages, uh, actually for both speech recognition and speech translation. Um, and this approach works very well for some tasks. It has really impressive performance on tasks like speech recognition um, on some languages where we have a lot of data. Um, but it has, still has quite poor performance um, for low resource languages or low resource tasks. Um, and here's just a sampling of results from the Whisper paper to give an idea. Um, on the x-axis, we have um, amount of training data in hours. Um, on the y-axis, we have word error rate, and each dot corresponds to the performance of Whisper on a given language labeled with its two-letter code um, that uh, has that amount of training data available in the Whisper training set. Um, and so you can clearly see that for the uh, languages where we don't have a lot of training data, of course, uh, word error rates are extremely high, sometimes higher than 100%. Okay, so that's sort of approach one. And then the second class of approach um, is rather than finding all of the labeled speech data that you can, um, instead find all of the unlabeled speech that you can find and pre-train a self-supervised representation model on that data. Um, and then fine tune that model or adapt it in some way on the limited data that you have for your particular task or language or domain. Um, and I think it's safe to say that this is the more common model approach these days. Um, and it really was popularized starting around 2020 um, with the wave to vec 2.0 model. Um, and these are some of the first results um, that where we started seeing in around 2020 that these models are going to change things. Um, so on the x-axis, we have the amount of label data, and on the y-axis, we have word error rate. And then all of the dark bars uh, correspond to using a pre-trained, self-supervised model, wave to vec 2.0. And then the light bars correspond to just supervised speech recognition trained on that label data. 
Um, and what you can see is that um, the pre-trained model outperforms the supervised model using 1% uh, of the label data. So from 100 hours, we can go down to one hour. Um, and even if we have a whole lot of label data, it still helps to pre-train the model um, on that data using the self-supervised pre-training task. Um, so since 2020, there have been a whole bunch of other um, self-supervised models that have uh, been developed. And they all are trained in, in the same way, where we start with a whole bunch of unlabeled uh, speech audio, and then we devise some kind of self-supervised pretext task, a task that the model uh, that, that we can label without actual human annotation effort, and that we can ask the model to solve on that unlabeled data. Um, and there's a bunch of different styles of pretext tasks. Um, so, for example, some of the common models, including wave 2 vec 2.0, involve some kind of masked prediction where we mask out some of the speech and we try to, uh, to reconstruct it in some sense. Reconstruct it, reconstruct an encoding of it, reconstruct a discretized encoding of it, something like that. Um, other models um, are uh, reconstruction in the spectral domain. Um, some models combine a whole bunch of self-supervised pretext tasks like PACE. Um, and in fact, we kind of have a zoo of self-supervised models by now. Um, this is a figure that was made in 2022. There are even more models now. As you can see, if you follow these lines, so each one corresponds to one model, um, most of these um, have been introduced just in the last couple of years. Um, and so um, faced with all of these choices, <laughs> Um, it can be hard to know what model to use for what task or how to use it. And so the community has been thinking about how to, uh, how to properly evaluate, how to compare models. Um, and one way of doing that is to set up leaderboards um, where models are compared on a whole bunch of tasks. Um, I know it's not easy to read these numbers. It's not necessary to digest this. I just wanted to show you that there is a leaderboard uh, with a whole bunch of tasks in the columns where a whole bunch of models have been compared. Um, this is the superb leaderboard um, that includes a bunch of benchmark speech tasks that uh, a large consortium of people have developed, including Shinji and some of his colleagues here. Um, and one of the common ways to quickly compare models is to take the pre-trained model um, and rather than fine tune it for each of these tasks, to freeze the parameters of the model and to learn a weighted sum of the pre-trained representation layers. So the parameters that are learned are just one weight per layer. Um, and that way we can more or less quickly compare a whole bunch of models. Um, so here are a bunch of models and here are a bunch more models, just to show you that, uh, <laughs> what we're dealing with here. Um, okay. Um, but um, despite all of this, we still don't really have a handle on what self-supervised models know in some sense. Um, so we know a few things, of course. Um, we know that these pre-trained models improve performance on many tasks and reduce uh, the need for labels. Um, we know that the vast majority, if not all, state-of-the-art speech models now use some form of self-supervised pre-training model. Um, we also have an idea that some of the layers um, seem more important than others and that that depends on the task. And we have this idea because we know that on the superb benchmark, we see different distributions of layer weights uh, for different models and different tasks. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a great way of adapting these models other than trial and error um, and choosing a model for a particular task. Um, we also don't have a lot of guidance for how to design the models themselves and how to design pretext tasks uh, to train a good model. And so what we'd like to know um, is a whole bunch of things. Um, we'd like to know what kind of linguistic information is encoded in each of these models and where within the model it's encoded. Um, we'd like to know how that depends on the pretext task, on the pre-training objective, and how that and uh, how that linguistic content changes when we actually fine tune the model. Um, and once we know the answers to these questions, perhaps that might suggest better ways to fine tune or to adapt the model. 
Um, and finally, we'd like to do this kind of analysis in a lightweight way that doesn't require us to train a whole bunch of downstream, a whole bunch of models for, for downstream tasks and tune all of them and, and all of that. Um, so that's something that, that um, we've been working on is trying to find lightweight ways to do quick analyses that give us this kind of information. Um, and what I'll show you today is not all of the analyses that we've developed, but just a few. Um, but feel free to ask me for more. I've got extra slides. Um, there might be questions that are not addressed in these slides, but, but they might exist. OK. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to do something quite simple. Um, we're going to take a bunch of pre-trained models. And they tend to ha all have very similar structure. Um, they take in the speech signal. Um, they pass it typically through some number of convolutional layers, often seven. And then they pass the result through some number of transformer layers, often 12 or 24. Um, and so what we're going to do is um, take some speech, pass it through uh, a self-supervised model, and then extract representations, different sorts of representations from different layers. Um, and then we'll measure their similarity by some definition of similarity to some external variables that we care about. OK. Um, so first, what are we going to extract? Um, so first, we'll extract frame level features. So um, YLT frame court means the frame vector um, at layer L at time T. Um, we'll also extract phone level features. So we'll pool frames just by averaging. We'll average the frames over a phonetic segment. Um, and we'll also extract word level representations by pooling frames over uh, word level segments. So of course, in order to do this analysis, we need to have alignments. So for the small amount of data that we're using for the analysis, we do um, align it at the word and phone level. Um, and besides these representations, we also extract MEL filter bank features, sort of standard MEL filter bank features, so that we can compare them to what's going on inside the model. OK. Um, OK, so like I said, we've done a few different sorts of analyses. But for today, I'll mostly just be talking about one, which is based on canonical correlation analysis. Um, and so what is CCA? Um, CCA is a way of defining a similarity or an extension of the idea of correlation um, for random vectors. So if I have a pair of random vectors, x and y, um, I'll define the, their similarity or canonical correlation in terms of correlations between projections of those vectors. Um, so just uh, to make it precise, before I make it precise, I'll mention that uh, we're not the first to use CCA in this way. It's been used previously to analyze text models. So if you're familiar with the NLP literature, you might have seen similar sorts of analyses done before on text models. They've also been used to measure similarity between speech, between supervised speech models in the past. OK. Um, and we're going to use it to measure similarity between these representations that we're extracting from the model and some external vector variable. OK, so now let's make it precise. So um, we're going to measure a, a set of correlations. Um, the first one, row one, will be the maximal correlation between projections of x and y. So we'll find the vectors a1 and b1 such that projecting x onto a1 and y onto b1 maximizes their correlation. Um, and then we'll find more such correlations, rho k, that maximize the same quantity uh, for some other pairs of projections of projection directions, a k, b k, under the constraints that the projected data um, has it is uh, the projected dimensions are uncorrelated in each view. That's what these um, constraints are telling are giving us. Okay, um, and then the score is just the average of all of these correlations. So it'll be something between zero and one. Um, and it turns out that you can solve this problem with an eigen problem that looks not unlike doing PCA, but on a different uh, matrix corresponding to a combination of the covariance matrices between x and y. Um, we, in fact, we're actually going to use a, a variant called projection-weighted CCA. I won't get into that aspect of it, but it's actually not very different from, from the basic CCA that I've shown here. 
Okay. All right, so I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the models that we're going to be uh, analyzing. Uh, so we started with a whole bunch of models, um, and as you can see, they, have, they vary along their training objective, uh, the amount of data that they're trained on, their size, um, the number of layers, um, as well as whether they're using audio-only training data or multimodal audiovisual training data. Um, we're going to focus on a subset of these models. Um, so each of these models tends to have a small and a large, and the small models in the audio model series are all trained on the same 960-hour data set, so that makes it nice to compare them to each other. So the results that you'll be seeing here uh, focus on the small models. Um, now, should I go, should I, should I give a brief introduction to the models themselves? Or, yes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so let me, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with many of these models, but I'll give a super quick introduction just so we're kind of on the same page. All right. So the model one is wave to vec 2.0, which I mentioned before. Um, and the pretext task for wave to vec 2.0 is to mask out some, uh, some subset of the speech frames and predict them. So it's a sort of masked prediction task. Um, a couple more details. So it consists of a CNN encoder. Um, the features that come out of the CNN encoder are then masked with some probability. Um, the resulting features go through some number of transformer layers. Um, and then the output of the transformer is compared to a quantized version of the local features that come out of the CNN encoder. So the, the goal of the model is to predict these quantized features, quantized local features. Um, and the loss is a contrastive loss that tries to encourage the predicted representations, these CIs, to be similar to the quantized features at the same frame, but different from inputs at different frames. So that's what this loss is doing. OK, so it's a mass prediction with a contrastive loss. Um, the next type of model is Hubert, um, which is another sort of masked prediction model um, with a few key differences. So again, we pass the speech waveform through some convolutional layers. We mask some of the frames. We pass it through a transformer. But now we're going to try to predict actual discrete uh, cluster labels according to a k-means uh, clustering of the Hubert features learned in a previous training iteration of the model. So in the very first iteration of the model, it's just uh, clustering basic features. And then in future iterations, it's clustering some internal layer of Hubert and then trying to predict those cluster IDs. And so the loss now is just a cross entropy, a log loss. Um, how, uh, how well do, do my uh, do my distributions uh, that come out of the transformer match the, the ground truth label? Um, and we're also going to look at a couple of related models. Um, WaveLM looks a lot like Hubert with an additional uh, denoising loss. Um, and AV Hubert is a type of Hubert that's been trained on audiovisual uh, data, so videos of a speaker's mouth. Um, and so the clusters that it's trying to predict are learned from both audio and video. Um, and then a final type of model that I wanted to mention is fast VGS. This is an audio visual model trained from images. Here's an image and their spoken captions. Um, so this is one model that's trained on a different uh, data set. Actually, so is AV Hubert. So AV Hubert and Fast VGS are both trained on a different data set from the other models. Um, so Fast VGS is initialized with Wave to Vec 2, but then um, it trains, it further trains with two uh, types of losses. One is a cross modal retrieval loss. So if we follow the uh, layers in this model, um, we start with the sweep speech waveform over here. That, as usual, goes through some convolutional layers. 
Um, some of the uh, frames get masked. Um, and then we go through some number of uh, transformer layers. And then there's, there are two branches. One branch goes back into a wave to vec loss, wave to vec style loss. And the other branch applies some more convolutions and some more uh, transformer layers. Um, and then has a contrastive loss that compares an image representation to what comes out of this branch of the model. Okay, so the, uh, the goal here is to, um, is to learn speech features that are informative about what's going on in the image, and the idea is that the image tells us what the speech is about. Um, so the representation, we might hope, is more uh, semantic. Okay. Um, are there any questions before I go on to results? All right, let's look at some results. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I showed you a bunch of models, and I told you we're going to use CCA to compare their representations to some external variables. Um, oh, shoot, I am not plugged in. One moment. All right, so let's look at some results. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to compare um, frame representations from different layers of each model to MEL spectral features. Um, so we just want to know um, how, how similar are the representations to standard MEL spectral features and where in the model are they more or less similar. Um, so let's look at that. Um, so on the x-axis are the layers. So C1 through 7 are convolutional layers, and T1 through 12 are transformer layers. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the CCA similarity between the representations at those layers and MEL spectral vectors at those same frames. And so again, the maximum is 1 here. Um, and each of these lines corresponds to a different model. Uh, the purple line is a randomly initialized model. Uh, so the idea of including that is just to make sure that any trend that we see is not just because of the structure of the model. Um, and so what do we see here? So first we see that the models all seem to be um, generating representations uh, that are very highly correlated with spectral features right around layers C5 through C7, so the last couple of convolutional layers. Um, so this might make us think that maybe we don't actually need the raw audio. Maybe we could have just used MEL spectral features. Um, and there have been um, a couple papers since that have suggested doing that. And, um, and they've shown that for some purposes, indeed, we could forget about the raw uh, waveform and extract MEL spectral features as usual. Um, Another thing we see is that um, the randomly initialized model also has some correlation with spectral <laughs> features. Um, maybe because that's just what convolutions are going to do, um, but a lot less so than the models. So the random model is not actually learning, uh, not actually uh, producing uh, MEL spectral features. OK. Um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, So there is some downsampling uh -huh. in these models, and then I believe what we did was we downsampled the MEL spectral the features to the same. I don't know exactly how the dams how we did the downsampling, whether we averaged or just uh -huh. subsampled. Uh -huh. Yeah. I see. So my guess is that's why you kind of are not just randomly. A CNN part is getting higher, not just purely because they uh, something mm. cross to the spectral feature, but uh, might happen to be more time resolution uh, that close mm. to the or original uh, 
uh, met a teacher yeah, last year. But oh, that's interesting. I have to think about that. Yeah. Uh, but for that, I just wanted to know where the downsampling was happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. but we can discuss it. Yeah. Yeah, good question. OK. Um, so nothing else sort of interesting besides those two points, I think. <laughs> um, yes? So as we well, previously talked about, it seems like transformers correlation uh, is a lot lower than CNN, right? So yep. The model architectures in inductive bias might be very different. So it would be, I, I, I'm just thinking, it might be very interesting to compare a pure transformer based model without the CNN bottleneck. Because the CNN bottlenecks are learning the filter banks. They are, they're basically mimicking the mouse spectrum's Fourier basis. Whereas a, it would be interesting to, to, to find out what the, might, there might be no correlation between the, what transformers are learning. Right. I mean, I would, if I had to guess, I would guess that a transformer would try to learn <laughs> spectral features as well, um, but, um, but maybe not be as successful. Um, but I'm not sure. I think it would be an interesting experiment. Okay, um, so the next thing we're going to do is look at um, the correlation of features at every layer with the features that come out of the CNN layers. So for the rest of the results, we won't be looking at the CNN layers anymore. We'll just be looking at the 12 transformer layers. Um, okay, so, um, so what you can see is that one layer past the convolutional network, um, all of the models have uh, slightly forgotten <laughs> uh, what came out of the convolutional layer. Um, the randomly initialized model just kind of slowly forgets uh, its input. Um, and the other models sort of separate themselves into two types of curves. Um, one type is, corresponds to the audio-only models, which have what we call an autoencoder-like behavior, where at the deeper you go into the model, the more different you get from the input. And then finally, towards the end, you do something like reconstructing the input. You get more similar to the input again. So that's what we're referring to as autoencoder-like. Um, and then the other two models are the multimodal models, um, which don't, with, whose loss is not directly attempting to reconstruct the input. It's not predicting the actual speech input itself in any sense. Um, and so those curves don't have that same autoencoder-like behavior. Okay. Um, so already this is telling us that there's kind of an interesting dynamic um, where the output, the final output of the model is looking more like the input than a few layers ago. Um, so let's look at some other, uh, some other types of variables. Um, so next we're going to look at phonetic content. So here we're going to look at phone segment representation, so representations pooled over phone segments, and compare those to phonetic labels, um, again using CCA. Um, and so the random model here doesn't seem to contain any phonetic information. That's encouraging. Um, and the models here, if you squint hard enough, again, um, seem to separate into a couple of groups. Um, one is models that are more or less monotonically increasing in terms of phonetic content as you go through the layers and models that have a big dip at the end, where they seem to retain most, the, the largest amount of phonetic content in some intermediate layers. Um, and if you look at what these models are, um, the models that have the big dip at the end are those models that have a loss that is based on predicting the local features or some function of the local features or a cluster of the local features. Um, so in some sense, they're trying to reconstruct uh, local features, whereas the other models that have kind of the more monotonic shaped curves um, 
are trying to predict phone-like clusters. Um, so for example, in Hubert, the clustering that is learned ends up being a phone-like clustering. Um, and so they end up continuing to retain phonetic information all the way through the highest layers. Okay. Um, okay, let's keep going up the linguistic hierarchy. Uh, so let's look at word content. Um, so here we're looking at um, representations pooled over word segments compared to word identity. Okay. Um, so now you kind of have a sort of similar shaped curve for most of the models with this, um, where there's always some intermediate layer or layers that seems to have the most word level content. Um, and then the highest layers tend to dip again. Um, but where that highest amount of word content is differs from model to model. Uh, so for certain pretext tasks, it's much higher layers than for other pretext tasks. Okay. Um, so there's sort of this sweet spot um, where the model seems to have the, the deepest linguistic information. Okay. Um, so you might at this point want to know whether all of these analyses have anything to do with downstream performance. Um, and in fact, it's, whenever we're doing this kind of analysis, it's not clear um, exactly what we're measuring, right? Because we're relying on some particular statistical tool. So it's always good to have some grounding in some other measure of performance. Um, so we looked at uh, correlations between our measures of content and downstream task performance for a few tasks. And it seems like, indeed, these measures are well correlated with downstream task performance for certain tasks. So uh, what are we looking at here? Um, so, so far, we've only looked at small models. Um, and the two figures on the right are for a couple of the small models that we looked at. But for these figures, um, I'm also showing a couple of large models, just for comparison. Um, so let's just start with one of these. So this plot on the right is a scatter plot of results for each layer um, of Hubert Small um, for CCA word, just the, CCA, the, the canonical correlation with word labels, um, versus performance on intent classification, so accuracy on intent classification. Um, and then each dot is labeled with the corresponding layer. And so what you can see is that there's a very high correlation between, uh, not linear correlation, but correlation, um, between the uh, CCA word value and the performance on intent classification. Um, and here we're measuring Spearman's row. So this is the rank correlation to account for the nonlinear uh, relationship. Um, on to the left of that, we're looking at CCA word versus some other uh, performance on another spoken language understanding task. I won't go through what each of the tasks is. Um, and then um, on the bottom, we have CCA phone versus word error rate on speech recognition and phonetic recognition. Not word error rate, sorry, accuracy. 100 minus the word error rate and then uh, phonetic accuracy on the left. And you can see that other than a couple of outliers, um, the, these uh, correlations are quite high. Um, and maybe more importantly, the layers that tend to be best in terms of one measure also tend to be best in terms of downstream performance. OK. Um, so this is everything that I've said. CCA word correlates well with speech recognition and with spoken language understanding. And CCA phone correlates well with recognition. OK. Except for those, yeah, 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 yeah. So like I said, there, there are a couple of outliers. Um, yeah, wave to vec2, the last two layers are outliers like any which way you look at them. Uh, they're going to be outliers. 
Yeah, just forget about the final two layers. Um, but no, but more importantly, if you look for, you know, which are the best layers, um, you know, if you look at the, at the rightmost values, um, they also tend to be the highest values. And so not, not the ex it's not that we're picking out the exact right layer every time, but if you look at the top couple of layers, they tend to agree. Um, and so that means that, um, that at least it helps us to pick out a f couple of layers that are good candidates for these tasks. OK. Um, and just a note, since we talked about um, uh, layer weighting um, for, uh, for measuring performance on the superb leaderboard, um, I wanted to mention that you might be tempted to look at those layer weights and use them as a measure of la layer importance, but um, layer weights don't correlate nearly as well with task performance. So if you uh, measure correlation overall, over all tasks, um, for layer weights versus, say, CCA Word, um, there is some reasonable correlation for the layer weights, 0.66, but not nearly as high as, as for CCA Word, which is 0.9. Um, and I, I think that's quite reasonable, um, right? When we, when we learn a regression model, we should not interpret the weights of the regression model as feature importance, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, uh, we, we, we know that. But we're often tempted to, um, but we shouldn't, um, and, th and this is why. OK. Um, all right. So one of the implications here might be that we don't actually need all of these layers for the downstream tasks. At least if we're going to keep the models frozen like we do in Superb, maybe we could just skip the topmost layers. Um, and that does actually seem to be the case. Um, so because the higher layers seem to contain less linguistic information, um, it seems that we can actually just remove them. Um, so here are some results um, for several tasks. So each of these plots corresponds to a task. Um, speed, ASR, phonetic recognition, and then two spoken language understanding tasks. Um, and then for each of four models, we're looking at, um, in the solid bars, the performance of the best single layer on this task. Um, and in the um, textured bars, we're looking at the superb performance, the uh, performance when we uh, linearly interpolate the layers of the model. Um, and what you can see, oops, sorry. Um, and what you can see here is that uh, the single layer performance is usually very, very close to the all layers performance. Um, and occasionally it's even a little bit better, meaning that we didn't do a great job of learning the layer weights. Um, but the, t the key takeaway is that they're generally very, very similar. Um, so it does seem like if we keep the model frozen, we can remove those top few layers a lot of the time. Okay. I'm gonna add one more model to the mix. Um, which is uh, speech LM. So one of the things that's been happening recently is people have gotten interested in using text data to improve the performance of pre-trained speech models. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because we have all this text data lying around. Um, and if we want these models to learn something about words or word sequences, then all of this text data um, could be informative. Um, so there have been a few different attempts to combine speech and text in various ways. Um, I'll just show results for one of these models um, called speech LM. Um, and what this model does is it differs, it, it's not exactly comparable to all the models we've been looking at for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that um, it's a, uh, a slightly different um, what did I want to say? Um, it's, it's a different, uh, uh, slightly different data set. And some of the data is actually labeled. Um, so this is not a purely self-supervised model. Um, so it has a bunch of speech and a bunch of text that are not aligned, but then it also has a small amount of aligned uh, or transcribed speech um, that trains on a liner between the, the speech and text. 
Um, so just a few words about how this model works. Um, so the um, speech, again, goes into some number of CNN layers um, and then transformer layers. And then at the same time, the speech is getting passed through a tokenizer. Um, and that tokenizer is either just a phonetic recognizer trained with the uh, labeled data or something like a Hubert tokenizer um, where we've used the label data just to align the text to the Hubert tokens. Um, but in any case, these are tokens. Um, and then what comes out of the speech transformer is compared um, via mass language modeling loss to the tokens. So we mask, we try to reconstruct those, um, those masked tokens. Um, and then, uh, before I get to this next part, I'll talk about the text branch. So the text gets passed through a tokenizer that just converts the text into tokens that from the same vocabulary as the speech token. So it, if the tokens are phonemes, then it just goes, looks up the word pronunciation in a pronouncing dictionary. Um, so the output of the tokenizer here is again uh, something like phones. Um, those get embedded um, and then both the text and the speech get passed through some number of layers of shared transformer. Um, and then finally, there's another mass language modeling loss for the speech side and a CTC loss for the text side, which is basically just trying to recognize text from phoneme sequences. Um, and the reason to do that is just so that we don't completely forget the text. <laughs> um, so the model, with, without that CTC loss, the model could just sort of learn nothing from the text. Um, another way to encourage the model to learn something from the text is this swap business where uh, with some probability um, the speech tokens um, are swapped for the corresponding text token at that point in time. Um, and that encourages um, the, this last uh, mass language model objective, encourages the model to learn something that's more text-like. Um, okay, so um, let's add this model to our results. Um, so the speech text model is in blue, um, and this is uh, phonetic content. Um, so it does seem like the joint speech text model uh, appears to have learned uh, more phonetic information than the speech only models. Of course, it does have this additional um, supervised part uh, of the training. Um, same goes for the word level um, information. Um, but more than containing um, more word information, it just seems to learn the word information at a lower, at a, a, an earlier layer. Um, okay, um, next we might wanna know if we've learned something even deeper like syntax or semantics. Um, and so, um, so one way to try to figure out if we've learned about syntax is to see if perhaps these representations um, organize themselves into things like part of speech tags. Um, and so what we're looking at here is um, two-dimensional TSNE um, visualizations of representations from different layers of the speech LM model. So this is the joint speech text model. Um, this is layer two, layer four, layer six. Um, and each dot uh, has a color corresponding to the part of speech of that word, okay? Um, so if it were learning something like parts of speech, we'd expect to see the dots clustering into uh, constant color regions. Um, and as far as I can tell, it's not really happening in layers two, four, or six. However, in layer eight, um, it does seem like the representations are organizing themselves more or less into part of speech clusters. Hopefully that's visible from back there. Um, and then it kind of seems to forget that by layer 10 or 12 again. Um, okay. Um, let's see if the speech only models do the same thing. So we'll do that for one speech model. Uh, this is WaveLM. So now we're looking at layer two, four, oops. 
six, sorry, <laughs> eight, 10, 12. Um, to me, it looks like if there's any clustering learned here, it's not nearly as good as uh, for the speech text model. Um, so that's sort of a qualitative look. Um, we can also try to quantify this. Um, and the way that we've done it so far, and I'm happy to hear if people have other suggestions, um, is we actually pulled up a paper from 2015 from Yulia Svetkov, who I think was here at the time, um, who um, was analyzing word embeddings um, along syntactic and semantic dimensions by measuring CCA similarity between word embeddings and vectors of syntactic or semantic features. So for each word, she would have part of speech and, and other sorts of tags. Um, and so that's exactly what we're doing here. And she called it QVEC, and there was a QVEC syntactic and a QVEC semantic. So here we're doing QVEC syntactic. So we're measuring the uh, CCA similarity between the word representations in each of these models and the syntactic vectors corresponding to those words. Um, and it does appear that, you know, like those uh, TSNE visualizations suggested, that SpeechLM really does have um, the highest syntactic content, and it does seem to uh, be highest at the layers that looked like they were clustering the best around layer eight. Um, other than that, um, these curves largely resemble the, the word curves that we looked at before. So wherever the model is representing words is where it's most representing the syntactic uh, information in the word. Um, and we could do the same thing for semantic vectors. So this is CCA similarity between word representations and QVEC semantic vectors. Um, and um, here we don't, uh, I didn't show you any sort of qualitative visualization. We're just doing the quantitative um, measure. Um, and again, it seems like speech LM certainly has the highest semantic content according to this measure. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about this is that the semantic information appears to be more concentrated in fewer layers than the other sorts of information. So there's just typically one or two layers that, that correspond to the peak. Yeah. No, no, there are different things in the syntactic vectors and I don't remember all of them. Yeah. Like it, it sort of makes sense that, sen that semantics is later in this pipeline, but you could sort of imagine you would see a spread if we were sort of trying to do just part of speech versus some sort of dependency type representation versus your Right, so we did not okay. separate those, but that would be interesting to do. Right, because text models certainly seem to have that right. behavior. Yes? Say that one more time. The uh, user subscript paper is uh, for non-contextual words. Correct, correct, yeah. And, and these are also not, oh, so I should, thank you for asking. I should add a little bit of information. So what we did here is we took those segment level word representations, which are pooled frame representations over a word segment, and then we pooled those over all of the instances of the same word type. Yeah, so then we got context-independent word vectors, which we then compare to these manually defined semantic and syntactic vectors. Sorry, one more time. Oh, I gotcha. Um, would we, could we plot these same curves without doing that pooling over all instances uh, of the word? Oh, sure. Um, which ones do you have in mind? Yeah, yeah. 
So that's, um, that's a bigger weapon than, than we're using here. This is, a, this is a much simpler technique, but we could absolutely do like all the probing that, that you know, people do on text models, we could in principle do on the contextualized speech representation. We're, we're actually, our goal is to make it as simple as possible, um, but um, yeah, those are all candidates. So I think, um, so one thing to remember here that is that at around layer zero, we're basically looking at like spectral features. Right. Um, and we don't really get anything even phonetic until much later. Um, so we're sort of doing a whole bunch of stuff before we ever get to what text models get as input. Is the way I look at it. It means that everything sort of ends up getting compressed in like an ideal world. If I had a 24 layer model, maybe I could like start to pull apart. Yes. Except that, uh, well. Except what? Except you don't seem to get uh, improved uh, uh, right. performance if you're adding more layers, maybe, because you tend to. Yeah. You know, so so it, it, it doesn't seem to be the case, right? That if you that if you just kept adding layers or going further out, you would get better performance on syntactic or up semantic or whatever, whatever tasks. So, I don't know. Yeah, so we have done, so I have all of the curves that I've shown for the small models for the large models as well. And for the most part, they just look like stretched out versions <laughs> of these curves where the peak of linguistic information is maybe in like layers 15 through 20 out of 24. Um, and I think um, one of the key differences here versus text models is that the pretext task is just asking a lot less of the model. The pretext task might be masking out individual uh, frames or short runs of frames which are much less, which correspond to much less linguistic content than a t text token would. So I think something that would be very interesting is this might suggest, hey, if we wanted a more semantic representation, should we be doing some masking tasks that looks more like masking out larger linguistic chunks? Um, yeah. Yes, Roshan. Roshan. <laughs> Uh, they're very good. <laughs> they're HMM alignments, so they must be very good. <laughs> we were just talking about um, how HMMs are still indispensable because they, uh, they give us really great alignments, whereas, whereas uh, neural networks still can't align data properly. Um, so I suspect the phonetic level alignments are more imperfect, which is why when we actually compute the phone segment representations, we pool over just the central part of the phone rather than we, we chop off the very edges just in case of any alignment issues. But for words, we don't bother doing that because the word alignments are so good. Yeah. Was there another? Yeah. yeah. This is the pretext task model. So this, this is, is not like fine tuned. Oh, this is not fine tuned. Not fine tuned. Wow. Oh, what about the fine tuning? Okay, good. Good question. <laughs> good question. So let's see. Um, how are we doing on time? We're good. Yeah. So okay. So let me show you how we're doing on fine tuning. Um, it takes a little bit of introduction to show those results because they're not using CCA. Uh, okay. So here's some results comparing pre-training and fine tuning. Um, so this is, we were comparing different sorts of analysis tools. So we use CCA as well as mutual information. The goal is to, to encode pretty much the same information in all of these analyses. So you could sort of ignore what the y-axis says, I think. Um, and so what you're seeing here, just look at the top two. Um, this is uh, phone content and then word content. 
and then the solid lines are pre-trained and the dashed lines are fine-tuned. Wow. And so what you can see is that, and they're fine-tuned for speech recognition. And so what you can see is that the fine-tuning is causing the model to learn all of that stuff that it was missing in the higher layers um, in the fine-tuning phase, while the lower layers are hardly affected. Yeah. This is 960 hours. This is the standard Libri speech training set. Yeah, and we've also looked at using less data, and you'll just see curves in between the, the solid line and the dashed line. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Should we go back to where we were? Have you tried other fine-tuning tasks? Not this kind of experiment. We have not tried comparing fine-tuning and pre-training. Uh, for other types of tasks, yeah. So, do you have a sense? So, so there are some previous tasks where they didn't carry word or image information to the end. So, does fine tuning uh, do comparatively there, or does it still have less image information because of the previous? So, we didn't do that experiment. Um, I guess you're referring to like A.V. Hubert, yeah. which doesn't tend to dip much at the end. I mean, I have a guess what would happen. Uh, you probably have the same guess, but we'd have to do the experiment, yeah. Okay, let's get back to where we were. We're almost done. But uh, as you can see, <laughs> I have lots of backup slides if you have questions. Um, okay. All right, so this is where we were, and that's really the last actual result that I wanted to show. Um, these last few slides were quite new experiments, and so things, you know, we're still like double checking things and things like that. Um, there's a chance that things might move around, but they seem pretty consistent with what we've been uh, expecting. Um, so I guess I'll just um, say a few final words about where we are. Um, so I, I think that through analyses like these, we can try to start to understand what's inside uh, these self-supervised models. So here are a few things that we've found so far. Um, the um, layer-specific information, which layers different information resides in, seems to depend on the pretext task. Um, we have some hypotheses for why there's certain relationships between pretext tasks and behaviors, but we might need to look at more models to do that. Um, and usually there's some intermediate layers that seem to contain the deepest linguistic information, the most word level information, the most semantic or syntactic information. Um, and that's not too surprising. Similar experiments have been done on text uh, language models, um, and similar results have been found there as well. Um, but we, the, the key question was just where in the model would, would, these, would the information be um, for speech models. Um, so the results that I showed you suggest um, at least that we can save a little bit of compute when we're using frozen models because we don't need to use um, the upper layers. Um, results that I haven't shown you yet um, suggest that we may be able to improve our fine tuning a little bit, specifically if we um, if you notice, those last few layers are often sort of the least informative, and so it turns out to sometimes be better to just forget the pre-trained parameters, reinitialize those final few layers, and then fine tune. Um, um, and then models like SpeechLM that also use text data plus a little bit of supervision uh, do seem to learn more linguistic information. Um, I think it remains to be seen whether that's because of the supervision or because of the text or some combination of the two. Okay, but obviously there's a lot more to do. There's lots of things we haven't measured. Um, we um, still need to check whether the results on downstream tasks um, hold up after fine tuning and after different sorts of fine tuning. There's kind of a variety of different ways that, that people like to fine tune these days. Um, we haven't looked at where non-linguistic information is encoded, like, um, like speaker information, 
uh, or emotion, which is maybe a little linguistic, a little not. Um, and um, I think a, another big question is, like we were talking about before, is whether we should be trying to make these self-supervised speech models more semantic. Um, if this suggests maybe some ways that we can do that, or maybe we should just leave them where they are and, and, and let them learn sort of low-level speech units and learn some language models on top of them. I think that's a conversation that's sort of going on in the community. Um, if you'd like to try out some of these types of analyses on your favorite model, feel free to download the code and try it out. Um, and that's all that I wanted to say, but I'm happy to take um, any other questions that you might have. Thanks a lot. We have time for a few questions. You want to Sorry. Uh, um, so I know there aren't a ton of variations of like the Harbaugh uh, style pre training, but I, I think it, I'm trying to figure out how to fit that into this discussion about linguistic versus semantic supervision. So I don't know if you have a sense for like how the like uh, object detections basically do or don't guide or structure that, that signal. And if I was to rerun those experiments with a different uh, visual space or different visual annotations, is there something that I could choose that would sort of improve our, you know, on some of these measures? So let's see if I can say something about that. Um, So first, let's go back to the first set of results because, oh shoot, where is it? So there are two kinds of fast VGS models that are included here. And they behave a little differently. So there's the, the basic fast VGS, which doesn't have that second wave to vec like branch. And that's the one that doesn't have that autoencoder-like behavior at all. It never tries to reconstruct the input. Um, and presumably that's because the only loss that it has is it wants to be similar to the visual representation. Whereas FastVGS Plus, which does have that second branch, does have that reconstruction-like behavior. OK, let me see if I have, I do have some more results on FastVGS. Um, All right, this is like the freshest, hottest off the presses result, which might be wrong, um, but let's look at it anyway. Um, so we tried to use these representations for the spoken STS task, which is a sentence similarity task, but on spoken language by just pooling over the entire utterance. Um, and that makes it easier to use those upper layers of the fast VGS model because those are massively downsampled. So you can't look for phonetic or sometimes even word level segments there. And so, okay, so this is basically a semantic task and it's showing somewhat similar behavior to other sort of word level tasks. Um, but for fast VGS, what we did was um, here's that first branch that we looked at before. It's this light cyan all the way up to layer 11 or 12, I guess. Yeah, layer 12. And then the next set of layers is the remaining ones from the visual branch. So that suddenly shoots up. Um, so that is more semantic <laughs> than the final layers of the speechy branch, of the wave to Vecchi branch. However, it's not the best. These are not the best layers for spoken SDS. The best layers are actually still around layer eight, as before. <laughs> for what that's worth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Shinji? Okay. Yeah. I actually want to know a bit more about speech. Then. LM? Then, um, yeah, so do I. Especially the, yes. <laughs> OK. Um, especially the text and the speech even after tokenized, the dendency is very different, right? Um, so, so what they do is they take the tokenized text and they duplicate the tokens as many times as they need to. to Make it similar. To, that's right. So they, they align the speech and the text using the supervised, using the label data. Mm -hmm. 
so they know which frames go with which tokens, and then they duplicate the text tokens. Yeah. No, not yet. So we'd like to do that. So yeah, maybe rather than fine tune the whole model or keeping it frozen, maybe we can add adapters just to the target layers that are found. Roshan? So semantic vectors, um, so these are manually defined vectors, um, so just from a lookup table. And they're things like animacy and other semantic quantities that I don't quite remember. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so um, I'll just pull up the CCA slide. That's true. That's true. So we're not look, we are looking at the average over all of these correlations. Um, and we actually talked about that at length. Because sometimes when CCA is used, people will just use the very highest correlation um, for just that first projection. Um, but we really wanted to know what is the total information in the one vector about the other vector, or vice versa. Um, so, so if we were to just take, say, the top one, um, we would basically see how well a linear classifier of one of the projections does on the other. But then there might be other information that's very informative between the two vectors about each other that's not in that top projection, and we'd be missing it. So that's what led us to look at all of them and average them. Uh, there might be an argument for like using the top k or something like that. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But I do think it would be interesting to just look at all of the correlations and get a sense of to what extent is all of the relationship explained by just that top projection versus not. Yeah. We can have one more question, and then we need to. Uh, um, yeah, but I'm still pretty interested in one. So I had this one question. I was, it was very interesting to see how well I could see the correlation like down to the past performance like they did for within a year. But can like, these correlation metrics like CCA board like, be also used for like, comparison between different models? Like, for instance, if. Uh -huh. Yes, that is a very good question. Um, and we talked about that, and I don't remember why we're not looking at that here. I don't remember. Let's ask Ankita. <laughs> but that's a very good question. We should, we should definitely look at that. OK, we should uh, um, head to the reception. But I'd like to uh, ask all of you to join me in thanking uh, Professor Lovescu for this wonderful talk. And if you'll all please head to the refreshments so that we can continue this uh, discussion. Thank you.